two minutes. Hi everyone, we will be beginning in less than one minute. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Mary Rubin and I am the past president for the Society of Florida Archivists. Today we are continuing our SFA Archives Month webinars. We will be holding all questions until the end of the webinar. Today we have Annie Hughes, Associate Librarian at the University of South Florida and Amanda Bozar, Operations Manager at the University of South Florida. Today they will be talking about the Audubon of Florida collections at the USF libraries. And with that, I will hand it over to Andy. Hello. Um, yes, uh, thanks everyone for being with us and thanks Mary for, for hosting the session. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, Amanda, could you um, unshare your screen for a moment? Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share. Um, where is the share screen here? Oh, I see. I see. Got it. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'd, uh, let me see here. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Oh, this thing is really, there we go. All right, can you see that? Um, Unfortunately, the web, we cannot. The website, uh, no? No. Oh, okay. Well, let's just not do that then. <clears throat> Apologies, everyone. I, I usually use Teams. It's, um, okay. So how do I stop sharing the screen? So right now it is sharing your email. There we go. Oh, there we go. Like, okay. Although All right. there is Teams on the top. Right. Let me see if I can. That is much better. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, there we go. Okay. You can see this page now? Yes. Okay. Um, this is just an interface um, that um, Amanda and, um, and our colleague Sydney Jordan have put together. Um, basically, uh, showing kind of what we're trying to do with um, with getting these collections together. You know, for a long time, we were kind of a typical Floridiana collection in the sense that, um, you know, we collected a lot of local and state history. Um, but, you know, I think that by the end of the, the 20th century, um, we really had reached a kind of a crossroads without knowing it. Um, I think a lot of the collections that we had relied on before that we were collecting things like cigar labels had been sort of collected to death, um, either, you know, in the private sphere or by museums and, and archives, et cetera. Um, so there there really wasn't much further to go with, with those types of collections. Um, and we were kind of looking for a new direction without really knowing what it was. Um, I know that we had been talking about getting more into the sciences for a long time, but we really didn't know how to go about that or how to make it kind of relevant to the things that we were already collecting. Um, so, um, so for a long time, I think we were just, some of us were thinking about new directions without really being able, um, without knowing what that would be. Um, and it really didn't become 
start to become clear until I got a visit from um, a aerial photographer named Skip Gandy. <clears throat> he, he came with a friend, um, Ann Hodgson, who was, um, she's an ecologist. Um, she worked closely with the Audubon, uh, Florida Audubon before, and, um, and a lot of other organizations. Anyhow, um, when they came, uh, he wanted to donate his um, really large collection of negatives. So he had been taking photos for uh, starting about 1970 to after 2000. Uh, he was one of the only kind of flying services around where you could have aerial photographs taken, especially the certain specifications. Um, and what this meant was uh, anytime a developer wanted to develop an area, uh, they would ask him to take uh, photographs. He also did this for like the Florida Department of Transportation, for example. So he would take photographs um, going all the way along the, the trail of where a road would be paved, for example. So on the one hand, he took a lot of environmental and ecological photographs. On the other, um, he took photographs for a lot of developers that were responsible for kind of paving over a lot of this stuff. Um, so uh, his career alone is interesting for that reason because of these kind of these two um, these two impulses or two things that are driving his business. Um, uh, he was also a commercial photographer, so we got a lot of commercial imagery too. But the um, the aerial stuff is really pretty interesting, and even his commercial stuff has a lot of things photographs that he took for for pleasure or to document what he perceived as a wrong. So there's a lot of pictures of pollution. Uh, he was really notorious for putting up pictures of pollution and polluters um, at his office on Davis Islands. Um, so, you know, I think that's interesting, but um, really that was just the beginning of kind of this, uh, this thing because um, talking to Ann Hodgson, um, she had mentioned that uh, she knew of some records that had been kind of sitting around down in the Keys for a long time that the um, uh, the Audubon had. So we ended up going down there together and I was really amazed by what I found. Um, I, I was told there would be some old records, but I wasn't, um, I didn't really know what to expect. And there was so much stuff, first of all, um, there's all these warden reports. Um, so going back to the 1920s. So for example, there's one, um, I think this, this one came out of the, a different collection, but it's a good example. Whiskey Stump Key um, is a, an island um, in Tampa Bay. And for a long time, there was an Audubon presence there. Um, there was a, a volunteer warden for many decades. Um, and since it was an important nesting site. So we have daily warden reports for years, sometimes decades at a time, you know, documenting the weather, nesting patterns, if there was intruders on the island, et cetera. So a lot of really interesting stuff there. But then there was these other records that were up in an attic. <clears throat> um, and I was amazed that they hadn't completely moldered away it, because they weren't in air conditioning or anything like that. But uh, the stuff had just been taken down. And when we looked at it, we realized it was um, the papers of Robert Porter Allen. He was um, the director of the Tavernier kind of research station for the Audubon. Um, it's down in the Keys for many years. But he was also really um, kind of the grandfather, you could say, of, of modern ornithology, um, where you... Um, where ornithologists, rather than killing specimens and, and kind of taking them apart, would um, would observe them living and how they kind of related to their ecosystem and everything else. So um, he was important, but then also really important in individual projects that he led. So he was chosen by the Audubon Society um, to lead the the. A whooping crane project, which during the 1940s, I think there was at its lowest point, there was 20 something, just over two dozen living whooping cranes. Um, and they've made quite a comeback. 
mostly uh, because of his contributions. What he was able to do was, through a lot of trial and error, find the nesting sites um, uh, during the summer, which is in a really desolate part of um, northern Canada. Anyhow, what's so interesting about this stuff is, first of all, I mean, I didn't really, I can, I confess, I didn't know who Robert Porter Allen was when I first saw the name, but our dean did, and our dean uh, Todd Chavez is very into birding, um, and and couldn't have been happier when he discovered, you know, that we got all this stuff from the Audubon, and that it was Robert Porter Allen. And what's interesting is he, he isn't just um, kind of notable as a um, as a scholar of the whooping crane and kind of all the way up there in Canada, but most of his research happened here in Florida and in the Caribbean. So, for example, um, uh, the roseate spoonbill was probably his biggest specialty. He wrote a couple books on um, that species, one of them called the flame birds. <clears throat> um, uh, and then the flamingo was another species that is kind of associated with the Caribbean and such. We're going to talk a little bit about them later. Um, uh, but, you know, so one thing kind of happened after another. So once uh, Anne had helped make that introduction to Jerry Lorenz, he's the um, uh, the scholar down there who runs the Tavernier Center. Then, you know, uh, I started to contact other places, um, including like the Coastal Island Sanctuary, which is in the Tampa area. Um, also uh, worked with the Lorida um, station, which is near um, like the Kissimmee Prairie and uh, l the northern banks of Lake Okeechobee. So, uh, and, and all these different sites, what's interesting about Audubon is they're kind of semi-independent, semi, you know, kind of autonomous, a lot of these places. So one might not necessarily keep up with the, what the other one is doing, et cetera. Um, and not all of them are research sites where they're kind of actively doing research. And that's really what one of the things we become really interested in is not just their administrative records and kind of internal correspondence and things like that, but the actual research records of the scholars who um, are doing this stuff. So people like Robert Porter Allen, they didn't just administer a program, but they were administering a lot of really important research. Um, so that's for, you know, my mind, that is like the core of what we're collecting right now, because, um, you know, we have, I'm sure Amanda will talk about this later, ideas to kind of parlay that data into a different um, kind of interface altogether. Um, but to give you a couple of examples of like the things that we've done, um, like programmatically is, um, you know, one of the things I'm a big champion of, of oral history. Um, and uh, we were able, I was able to get Anne actually to, uh, to do a series of oral histories with kind of retiring people in the Bay Area who were really responsible for the cleanup um, and kind of mitigation efforts around Tampa Bay. Um, and through 20 different interviews with everyone from activists to scientists to people in um, you know major industry in the area, we're able to really document a you know, 30, 40 year effort ever since about 1970 to clean up Tampa Bay because it had really, um, it was really in desperate straits um, by the 1970s and early 80s. Um, so we've also, uh, so we did a bunch of oral histories with those. I think those were, were really interesting. Um, and then we've also teamed up with the ELAP program, which is Environmental Land and Acquisition Protection Program, which is, um, I believe it's a, a Hillsborough County program. I don't know if it goes beyond that or not. Um, so we also have done an oral history series with Joe Gidry uh, doing that one. Um, let me see here. Uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to point out too is um, uh, the the latest success for us has been Corkscrew Swamp, which uh, is right near Naples. Really, Naples is budding right up against it. It's kind of pancaked in that direction. So it doesn't have any farther east that it can go without going through or around that sanctuary. Um, so it's a really important site. And uh, there's, it's also been a really important site of a lot of research, Audubon research. Um, so the largest collection I think we've gotten to date has been from Corkscrew. 
and we just happily got a report that um, uh, they want to give their old library to us as well. So much of their, you know, their reference stuff is online now, but there's a lot of old reference sources that we would love to get our hands on and add to our um, our print collection, and to have uh, more monographs in addition to all the archival stuff that we have. Um, one other thing that I wanted to to show you is um, this letter. Everyone can see this. <clears throat> um, this is a a good example of what um, what can be done with this uh, these types of paper. So a lot of stuff got digitized when we initially got all these papers. Um, so uh, this was among those things. And what was really interesting is. Um, it must have been about six months after the donation, maybe a little more, but a lot of stuff had already been scanned. And um, I got contacted by Jerry Lorenz, who had um, been in contact with the Navy. Um, basically, um, there was a dispute about whether or not um, flamingos had been nesting on an island near a naval base in the Keys. And supposedly there was a nest there, and the Navy said that the flamingos weren't native to Florida, so they didn't have any responsibility of protecting the nest or mitigating their activities around the nest. And um, and you know, Jerry discovered that yes, of course the the flamingo was ca classified as an invasive species in Florida. Um, so if you, for example, if I find a flamingo with a broken wing and take him to a shelter or something, um, uh, you know, they, they won't help it or it'll, it'll, um, be sent out of the state or a lot of times it'll just, it'll end up dying because it's, they're treating it like it's a python, but it's a flamingo, which is much more local to Florida than a python. Um, anyway, long story short. Uh, Jerry ended up sort of in desperation doing a Hail Mary and just searching our, our digitized materials and he came across this letter from 1937. Um, what's interesting here is there uh, he's writing about spoonbills, uh, it's an interesting name for an island there, um, but um, talking about spoonbills uh, on certain aisles. So as you go down here, they go into more detail about all the uh, the nestings that they found. So they actually found some pretty major nests at the time. Um, and what's interesting is Jerry was able actually to use his letter um, as evidence to show that flamingos had in, fest, in, in, in fact been nesting here for a long time um, and should be reclassified. So as far as I know, that has been going through the, the organs of Florida Fish and Wildlife and the flamingo will be reclassified as native to Florida. And without this evidence, it never would have happened. So um, anyway, uh, that's uh, I'd like to pass it over to Amanda to, to get into more particulars. Um, just a moment here. Uh, trying to open this thing up. Give me just a moment. I think the end share should be towards the top, Andy. There you go. Yeah. Um, you got it. Okay, good. All right. So I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to start with a PowerPoint and then I'm going to jump over um, and show you guys a little bit of a hub that we built. But we'll start um, here. And I did also want to just echo Andy and thanking Mary for setting this up and, and getting this going for us today. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you guys being here uh, during your lunch hour just to take some, some time to listen about our collections. Um, as Andy mentioned, uh, curating the Florida Audubon collections has kind of naturally evolved over time into what's become a much broader initiative. We are now working towards a Florida environment and natural history collection that is going to encompass um, more ecosystems and more types of species. And so wanted to talk a little bit about how we foresee this project growing um, and moving forward and how we're handling it, um, particularly during COVID um, and how that's changed a little bit about what we're, what we're doing here. So, 
Our holdings compile the work and research of professional scientists serving in academic and other public service roles, as well as political officials and academics outside the scientists, sciences. So we're trying to bring in a lot of different ecological voices into one place here. Um, and in addition to contemporary scientific research and policy records, we do also have some of those special collections classics, like our extensive collection of you know, 400 year old herbaria books and things along those lines. So there's, there's a really good mix that we've developed. Um, we have a particularly strong uh, background in herbaria in special collections that helps really bridge um, a lot of these issues that we're talking about now uh, leading towards, you know, rapid habitat decline and things like that. Because when you look uh, to some of these books uh, that we have in our rare department, you see Florida birds that are now extinct um, or assumed extinct. And they're, you know, the common ones that the authors are speaking about most frequently. So it provides some good context for a different type of scholar, perhaps, that might be interested in that. And our dean often reflects on over 3 billion bird deaths since 1970, which marks a population loss of about 30% of North American birds, which is rather striking, especially for us collecting in Audubon. And one challenge that we face as a library, a university library though, is indicating to the scientific community that we have materials that could definitely support their research, we feel in, in a variety of different ways, providing some both contemporary and historical data. Um, and in addition to scientists, also policymakers, um, like Andy's story with the flamingos really helps to exhibit. Um, and this is all driving us to a goal of developing a, a centralized portal that will make it um, accessible for researchers to engage with both the materials, um, but also find ways for them to engage with data um, in a real world kind of context. S scientists who can provide their data, we can provide a hosting platform for it and it can be accessible. But this is at this point a little bit of a stretch goal for us. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the, in the meantime to, to make these collections more accessible um, and visible for everyone. So our current goals, and I've boiled down our technical, um, very long strategic initiative goals to basically being that we want to network with researchers, we want to provide multiple access points, and we want to contribute to the advancing of the knowledge of Florida's environment and natural history. Um, and when I'm thinking about this in terms of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis for how do we highlight this collection? What are we focused on? What does our team discuss um, when Andy's getting ready to, to collect items, when our head of the department is helping to facilitate programming and getting us new donations and donors? Um, and how do we all work together on this? And I really feel like it comes down to data and access being our big central points that we're focused on right now. Um, and the first is data because we want it to be a collection that is relevant to sci scientists. And so we've really made this a strategic goal uh, for, for all of us. And within our current holdings, we do have quite a bit of data that we're able to pull out. And that's what we're starting with um, to kind of show what is possible with what we have. Our digitization um, department within our digital scholarships, our digitization team within our digital scholarship services department has already started developing digital surrogates of a lot of documents, like Andy said. We have some items here um, with some field notes. <coughs> Sorry, my dog has decided to go nuts. With some field notes um, from Dr. Ogden, as well as some items from Robert Porter Allen tracking uh, population characteristics for um, wintering birds. And one of the challenges that we're facing here is how do we start to put this in a format that is readable and screen readable for people. And so transcription has become a big part of this conversation that we're having with digital scholarship services. Um, and they are actively working on getting these materials not only digitized, but transcribed and accessible for people to search in different ways. Um, we've really, focused on Robert Porter Allen as the center of our, our digitization push, but at the same time, there has been portions of other collections like Coastal Island Sanctuary and Lorida that are available in USF Digital Collections now already visible. Um, we're pretty lucky when we have donors who support uh, the digitization of their materials. So Dr. Ogden included a fund to go with his to support the digitization and we're able to work with his materials. It's a wonderful collection that is spanning from the 1970s into the 2000s, and it's showing coral reef life in the Caribbean 
which has changed dramatically from the beginning of his career to now. And so having decades worth of images and field notes and documents can really help illustrate the, this trajectory of you know, climate change and habitat decline that we want to support research on. And so being able to have a collection like his digitized and accessible is particularly helpful. One of the things that uh, we're special collections is helping to, uh, our digitization department with in particular is helping to formulate a metadata schema. And so uh, most of us are part of a Flynn metadata working group with them. Um, and Flynn is what we call our Florida Environment and Natural History Collections. In order to better reach the scientific communities, we recognize that standard Dar Dublin core is not kind of hitting all of the points that we would like to hit it getting our information out there, but we think that we could go even further if we used a scientific metadata schema. So we've been working with um, discussions over ecological metadata language, Darwin core, ISO, um, as well as just enhancing our scientific taxonomy and terminology to hopefully make this a little bit clearer and cleaner um, to understand. And I'd say that our stretch goal for getting the metadata really strong in these areas would be um, to integrate a little bit of linked data with what we eventually come up with. But again, this is that's a little bit further down. Right now, we're focused on getting uh, stronger metadata schemas into our digital collections so that they can be more reachable for, for scientific audiences um, that would support us. From a digital curation perspective within special collections, um, we've also recently migrated to archive space. And I mean, like last week we migrated to archive space. It's very new for us. Um, and we're experimenting with our possibilities there. Um, particularly, I'm looking at creating a workflow for linking um, digital object records with our collections and linking that out to our digital collections. So we will have then a way for researchers to go directly from the collection, the item, and then to the digital object and be able to follow that all the way through the finding aid, um, making it you know, even more discoverable for everybody. So we're pretty excited about this. Um, and it'll be just yet another way to kind of enhance the use of this collection for us. So what are we doing in the meantime? Um, while we can't you know, we're not we're not quite to the hub yet. We're still digitizing quite a bit and we're working on ways of making it accessible. And by the way, in March, everyone's sent home, right? So what do we do um, during COVID where everyone can still get new ways to access this collection? So one of the things that I worked on in the beginning um, along with our collection specialist, Sydney Jordan, was we decided to kind of take the information that was in the Florida Environmental Interface that Andy showed at the beginning and enrich that a little bit and create a Flynn virtual tour. So Florida Environment and Natural History virtual tour within an ArcGIS interface. And we found that this was the best um, kind of platform for us because of the mapping tools. We're not using the mapping um, extensively at this point. We've used it in a few different places, um, including this map that's on the main hubs page, which allows people to see where the different collections are coming from. They can click on it, they can get a little preview, um, and it will give them a hyperlink to the catalog record. So the mapping features have the ability to kind of make those connections for us. We do eventually want to integrate even more of that, which is why we went with this platform so that we can kind of build up to what our goals were. We'd like to be able to illustrate kind of the movements of the birds and the shifts in populations and things along those lines, but those are kind of our way of stacking our project out forward. As you can see, we have a lot of different directions that we're interested in going with this. Um, so just to back up for a bit, this idea of a virtual tour, um, and just to give a little bit of a background on, on me and starting this. When we started um, 2020, I was two weeks into my new job in special collections, um, and all signs had really pointed to 2020 being a year packed full of exciting Flynn events and new acquisitions and a massive push of digitization to support access for these materials. We actually did achieve all of those three things, um, but just on a smaller scale than we were dreaming in January. Um, and we just wanted, though, to keep connecting with researchers. We wanted to find a way to kind of keep ourselves in their mind when everyone was at home and disconnected and feeling um, 
just a little bit separated from things like archives um, because of, of the pandemic. So I decided to leverage some tools that I'd learned in previous positions. Um, I'm a historian by training. And for the past four and a half years uh, before taking this job, I worked in digital humanities positions. So I created interactive multimodal textbooks for West Point um, and their diversity program. I was a digital teaching fellow at USF in the English department um, where I developed different innovative digital pedagogy assignments for use in writing courses. And working with the team in special collections, we decided to all kind of use our different skills that we had um, with great knowledge of the collections coming from Andy and tomorrow our head, um, really great ability to get in there and pull out fascinating information and get our scans for us and get stuff organized from our collection specialist, Sydney Jordan. And then I kind of took the lead on designing out the layout for the virtual tour. Um, and we were able to put together a tour that people were able to access throughout the summer. Um, and we were able to host some events around the tour to help get people in and, and looking at what we've done. So I'm gonna go ahead and just show you guys a little bit of what that looks like so that you can see what we did. Okay, so this is on the ArcGIS platform and you have a hub homepage. We decided to kind of organize it onto multiple pages to make it easier and cleaner to see. On the main page, um, we have an introduction to our initiative. We have a description of our process, which not um, anything revolutionary, but we thought this could be particularly helpful for student users. And so if you're looking to kind of leverage collections um, to undergrads, which we, we think that our materials could be used in an undergraduate classroom as well, that, that this might be helpful for them to see. So we included that information and links to our other um, platforms and programs that would be of interest to them. And then below that, we have links to six collection pages. We, we lumped our collections into these kind of environmental areas or eco, you know, our little ecosystem. So we have air, land, and water. I have one for rare books um, and maps where that kind of covers our bound material. And we also did a virtual tour, like a walkthrough of an exhibit that we put up the first week of March. We were very excited to put up this exhibit and had no idea that we would be sent home for seven months immediately after. So um, we decided to go back in when we were given permission, took some photos and created kind of a virtual walkthrough of, of the exhibit. So you can click into it. Sometimes it takes just a second to load up but it gives them a walkthrough of what the exhibit cases looked like. So it's just a little bit of something different. Um, but our main focus when we built this was to create pages that highlighted the different aspects of the collection. So Andy talked about our ornithology collections. We have here with a, you know, a profile on Ann Hodgson's that we included, but also ways for viewers to click in and look at what the collections would look like. Um, with a few examples of records that they can take a look at. The land one has a lot of our political papers. So we tried to kind of diversify more, you know, field notes on the Audubon. In our, um, in our land one, we have a lot of environmental legislation. We have papers from multiple governors, senators, uh, state congressmen. And so just to kind of mix up what people were seeing, we tried to diversify that in these different pages and make it more interactive and engaging. And in our water exhibit, we have um, kind of a focus where we highlight uh, Dr. Ogden as one of our key donors, um, knowing that it's important um, to, to really kind of highlight all this exciting new material that we have coming in um, because it shows that the collections are growing and that it's something that we want to keep working towards. So we really wanted to, to make an emphasis on the really excellent material that's, that's going to be digitized shortly. And we just have some previews here. We offer a few places where you can link to full text. So that's a possibility with a virtual tour like this. Um, and to scroll down a little bit, you're also able to embed things like videos right onto your pages. So this 
became a really helpful tool for us to showcase a lot of what we already have for Florida environment and natural history. It gave us a platform for showing things that we had digitized already that were scanned and digitized by our digitization team, but also to give a little bit of materiality that us archivists really like. Um, so you can see what the books look like holistically. Um, and then you can get internal scans that were a bit cleaner and up close, but it gives you kind of that contrast and that balance. And there's the opportunity to do that by building it out in a hub like this. So that was our um, kind of our rationale for doing that. And we're pretty happy with, with the results as they've come out. It's something that we can constantly change. So I've already been thinking on the back end of how we're gonna incorporate corkscrew um, into the Audubon page and waiting to see some of the exciting stuff that Andy has recently processed there. So there's a lot of potential to kind of keep it, keep it moving, keep it growing um, as you go forward here. So I'm just switch back over to my slides just to wrap up. So where are we gonna go now? Um, and this is, we hope, into an online data portal. Uh, we want to create a comprehensive data-driven portal to unify the Flynn initiatives across USF libraries, something that can handle a lot more data, a lot more imagery than what we can do in something like an ArcGIS page, but something that does have the capacity to hold those kind of backgrounds and anecdotes in a way that something like just digital collections um, isn't designed to do because digital collections holds our materials, but they're not offering that story. So we want something kind of in between those two. Um, and so we're shooting for this portal. We, we like to think of it as sometimes as a nest um, to kind of hold everything together. And data will again kind of be our central goal here. Our vision is to position USF as a leader among US institu academic institutions by establishing a central portal. Um, to house environment and natural history data and providing sustainable institutional support for ingest creation and distribution of archival resources centered on the impacts to and effects on Florida's natural environment. And so that's what's kind of driving us forward here. Um, the portal would seamlessly show USF Flynn digital collections, faculty publications from our institutional repository, EAD information, and host incoming data sets, um, including born digital records from scientists and scholars, um, as well as any just kind of raw data that they keep digitally that we can host and make searchable and available for them. And by bringing this all together in one place, we hope to create a portal that is relevant to students, faculty, and outside researchers, making it broad and diverse um, and engaging. We continue working towards the ultimate goal of this portal, um, but we're definitely mindful of current limitations, including staffing and continuous access to collections. As we build the portal, um, we are continuing to ingest process and digitize materials to continue to build out this fascinating meta collection of Florida environment and natural history. Um, and make it as accessible to the public as we can at this point. Um, a slow phase reopening of the library is thankfully allowing us to work with researchers more. And we are looking forward to seeing how uh, the Flynn virtual tour that we've set up and we launched in July for, for the public um, might impact interest in viewing the collections and see if it starts bringing people in now that we can accept appointments. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. We know that we have a lot of directions going forward and there's a lot of different potential for what we're doing. So we're excited to, to see where it takes us. Uh, thank you so much for listening. So we can definitely open the floor to questions now. Yeah, one thing just uh, that I would add too is um, <clears throat> like uh, one of the latest pieces of good news that we got is um, the Duckwall Foundation has given us $10,000 to do uh, an oral history project. So we're going to be doing interviews with uh, longtime employees and volunteers for the Audubon. And uh, I think it's a, it's a really cool project because it also kind of helps to sort of um, uh, help beat the bushes to try to uh, see if there's any other collections out there. A lot of these volunteers and stuff have been doing research of their own. So Well, if anyone has any questions, I muted myself instead of turning my camera on, please feel free to ask your questions in the YouTube chat or come forward on Zoom. I will uh, 
give you five to 10 seconds before I ask my questions. All right, uh, first off, I wanted to say that the ArcGIS website is gorgeous. I happen to have a digital exhibits meeting this afternoon, so I'm very happy to take that back to that group and be like, this is what I would like to do. <laughs> um, anyways, I did want to ask about, you mentioned that there are digital objects in a space or archive space. What platform are you using for the digital objects? And I apologize if I missed that. No, I, I specifically didn't quite mention because we're um, we're currently in Sobex. We haven't linked anything yet because we're um, we're in talks to um, potentially migrate our items. Uh, USF underwent a consolidation, and so all of our campuses are now one campus, and so all of that's a little bit floaty right now. So that's why it's very theoretical on how we're going to do that. But um, we've definitely talked about several different options for for where they might end. Ah, okay. Um then you probably won't be able to answer the next question quite fully, but um, you also mentioned that the ArcGIS is linking to the catalog. I was wondering about all the crosstalk, like where's what's linking to what, and is it a circle of just links or? Network? Yeah, we, we made sure that each item was hyperlinked back to our, um, like just our central mango catalog. Just we have a, we every item, like every archival collection we have has a catalog record. So we're linking to that. And if it's linked to kind of collected digital objects, that'll link to our current digital collections, which is in Sobex. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. There's a comment from Zoom. Very interesting. Thank you. And someone in YouTube, Kayla, great collection. Have you thought about sharing this to other portals with similar collections from other institutions? Yeah, I think we really haven't had much to share until the, until this um, recent, you know, build out by, uh, you know, Amanda, which I agree is just really beautiful and clean. Yeah, as far as I know, we haven't um, really kind of tossed that around just yet, but I think we're getting to a point where that might become part of our conversation for sure. Right. And like at the beginning of this year, I had intentions to hit the road and try to go to some ornithological meetings and stuff. And it, you know, just didn't pan out. I happen to know Kayla, so I suspect she is referring to DPLA. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that gives any insight into your answer. Okay, great. Another comment from the Zoom chat. Great, glad to have this information. We've gotten the local Audubon Society's annual bird counts and observations going back some 25 or more years, along with re the records of Perdido Bay Citizens Group that monitored water quality for several decades and gathered studies, research reports, local government reports, et cetera. Similarly, local West Florida environment records and reports in a number of areas, especially super fun sites in Pensacola. Very cool. And Kayla just confirmed, yes, DPLA. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Yeah. If there are any other questions. I will give it 20 to 30 seconds because I know YouTube is on a delay for us. If there are no other questions, thank you both so much. I really enjoyed today's presentation a lot. <laughs> thank you. And looks like there's no more questions. So I will be ending the stream now.